Today we get the lovely opportunity to talk about America going absolutely flat broke. Now I found some good sources today I think you guys will enjoy. Uh, there's some good cartoons I think you guys will enjoy. Uh, I, I previewed for you. What's up? I give three, no? Uh, I previewed for you yesterday some of the developments that are going to lead us into this place. I was going to get one. So for today, we're on 7.7. .7. The stock market crash and the beginnings of the Great Depression. Causes and consequences. So today is, is, is economic to an extent because we're dealing with the biggest economic crisis in American history. Um, but a, a lot of today's economic problems can also be rooted in the politics and society of the 1920s as well. So that's the reason I wanted you to, to, to really hone in that thinking in your thesis uh, as we think about what happens in the 20s that might lead us to a place where everything collapses at the end of the 20s and people are, are literally dead broke, like, like suicide broke. Which is crazy. Uh, so your prompt for the day is here. Louise, give us, a, give us a nice read, please, sir. Evaluate the short and long-term causes of the Great Depression. Cool. So uh, the Great Depression is, in my opinion, the most significant non-war event in American history. The most significant non-war event in American history. Yeah. There, the fancy behind you. Uh, Kelly is a small human, and I don't want her to get blocked out. I like that. And I can see everybody else. I love how they gave uh, Caesar a really short string balloon, which makes him more sick. Right, so even when he like, carries it the hallway, it's still like, I hide for everybody else. It still slaps my face. What? It still slaps my face. Exactly. There we go. Right? So you can go over here and remind you Caesar out. So um, I would argue that what do you guys think I would say is the most important event in American history? Civil War. Right? Because of the social, political, and economic changes that becomes because of it. Uh, the Civil War is the most monumental, fundamental shifting event in American history. Um, World War II is big and important, right? Uh, you can make an argument that the Spanish-American War is big and important because of the growth of imperialism because of it. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's important, but in terms of non-war events, the Great Depression has the biggest amount of change in terms of what happens because of it. So today we'll talk about causes and then outcomes as well. Your key concepts are there. Um, but let's just talk about uh, what the economy is doing in the 1920s, what politics are doing in the 1920s, what societies are doing in the 1920s. All three of them will play a role. Back a step. So back to your thesis. Let's categorize three things. Society, economy, political system. Uh, what's happening in the 1920s? Attack one of these themes for me, please, Johnny. Pick one and tell me what's happening in the 1920s. That would fit into your thesis uh, categories. Cool. Corruption and politics. What else is happening politically, uh, Elion? Nineteen twenties. Government is uh, oh, so laissez faire. Yeah. All right, that's fair. Uh, what else? Uh, more conservative. conservative policies. Conservative policies usually mean pro what? Good, pro business. That's that's our political situation. All right. Uh, hit economics for me, uh, Luis. Uh, there's a new wave of consumerism. Beautiful. Good job. Good good language. A new wave of consumerism. Let's not get carried away. Okay. Cool. Uh, what is fueling this cons uh, consumerism, uh, Slaney? What fuels this consumerism? Two things fuel it. Credit, thank you. Good credit. And what's the other fuel to consumerism? Advertising. Good job. Uh, and society. Uh, Brett, hit it for me, please. Uh, the Great Migration caused an increase in nativism and whites. Nativism slash white supremacy. The Great Migration for African Americans from the South oh, leads yeah. to a bunch of social change. Yeah. Um, more. <laughs> What'd you say? Huh? Say louder, brother. It was something proud. Like pride. And it, it basically gave them a region, like parliament. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, no, it's not separate. Good. You said nativism? Yeah. Anti-immigration. Good. Anti-immigration policies? Good. Anti who else? Jews. Jews, absolutely. Catholics. Jews, Catholics, Italians, Red Scare. Oh, yeah. Right, anti communist. Cool. So, all of these together will help lead us to the Great Depression. You might be thinking, like, how does, how does anti-immigration, anti-communist, uh, uh, how does all this red scare things lead us to a Great Depression? Guess what? Newsflash. Immigrants buy things, too. Immigrants might also need appliances. Ah. Immigrants might also use credit. Immigrants might also pay bills. Migrants in the South might be laboring on a farm economy. So all I know this, these are easy in terms of how we get to the Great Depression. This one's a little bit of a harder pull. But keeping in mind that all the entire nothing I keep telling you guys that nothing in history happens by accident. That this entire context of the 1920s is going to create a tornado effect, so to speak, that tumbles our entire economy until literally everybody's broke. Which is wild. Nice to know, guys. So the Great Crash. A lot of people like to say that the stock market crash begins the Great Depression. I would argue false. The stock market crash is just a symptom in a broader economic collapse. It's just one event that helps lead us into a Great Depression rather than the cause, right? For example, let me give you a, a non-economic example. Was the election of Lincoln the cause of the Civil War? No, what was? Uh, the Union. No, what was the cause? Slavery. slavery. slavery right? Expansion of slavery is the cause of the Civil War. It's the election of Lincoln and then Southern Secession which starts the Civil War. Likewise, the stock market crash isn't the cause of the Great Depression. It's the start, so to speak, of the Great Depression. Unless, like I told you yesterday, you're a farmer, in which case, when does your Great Depression start? In the, yeah. in the 1920s, right? Post-World War I, during the early 20s, absolutely. So before the stock market crashes, uh, we have some warning signs that we ignore. 1927, we have a slight recession. We, we have a slight downturn in our, in our uh, economic progress. Who's it? Someone trying to kill me without me knowing who they are? Is it you? Is it your umbrella? Then why is it at your desk? Are you trying to kill me? I'm clumsy. Guilty. Um, so we have a, a slight recession, but we ignore it. Right? We're like, oh, whatever, we're going to come back real quick, no big deal. Right? So what do we do? We lower interest rates. Makes it easier to get your hands on money. Ah, more credit. Right? Making it easier to get your hands on extra loans and, and, and making it easier... To, to add liquidity to the economy. Uh, and then we're thinking, oh, this is a slight downturn in things. If you look at the economy like this, the 1920s, check it out. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 27. 27 is a downturn. Maybe we'll go down to here. So we lower interest rates. When the interest rates are lower, it means you're paying less money to borrow money, so to speak. It makes it easier or cheaper to borrow money. Uh, what do people do when things are down a little bit in the 1920s? If interest rates drop, yeah, people will think that, oh, this is perfect. I can buy low. I can buy when things are cheaper because they dipped a little bit. Interest rates drop. It's easier to borrow money. People borrow a bunch of money so they can buy more credit and buy more stocks and buy more investments, thinking they're buying low. So we come out of this little pretend dip stronger than before. Yeah. So this easy credit as interest rates decline means people are buying more stocks. You can borrow more money because it's cheaper to borrow money. That's what interest rates are, the, the cost you pay to borrow money. And now people buy back into the economy and we come back up stronger than ever. But this leads to speculators or investors in the stock market to buy up stock on margin. Buying stock on margin because it's cheaper for a hot second. But now you're buying your stock on credit, so to speak. And then when everything collapses, you're still gonna owe that money. So 1928 happens. Look at that election. Look at that election. Wow. Yeah, it's impressive. Herbert Hoover kills it. Literally. I'll tell your story in a minute. It's a good story. Herbert Hoover killed it. Uh, the Republicans win not just the North, but a good chunk of the Upper South. States that had been Democrat, like Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, Virginia. The Republicans do a great job. 
primarily because of the economy. They're saying, look, it's all so beautiful, it's all so prosperous, vote for us, we'll continue these policies. But also he's running against Al Smith. Al Smith is the first ever Catholic running for major, uh, 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 pre excuse me, running for the presidency in American history under a major party ca uh, campaign. So the Democrats nominate Al Smith, he's a Catholic. How does America feel about Catholic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, looking at the South, the South also hates Catholics. Why do they vote Democrat then? Because Republicans are worse, because Republicans mean Reconstruction. Reconstruction means civil rights for black people. I know, right? It's like, God, we hate Catholics, but whew, at least he's not a Republican because they like blacks. Hence, Al Smith. So, uh, rough election for the Democrats. Herbert Hoover is like, damn, I got this. Look at America. America loves me. I even won Florida. I even won Texas. Republicans never win southern states in the early 1900s because Republicans are the party of big government. Republicans are the party of big business. Republicans are the party of reconstruction. God forbid you win southern states. And here's Herbert Hoover winning a bunch of southern states. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal. So take a second and read that uh, brief excerpt from his nomination speech when the Republicans pick him as, as their nominee. What does he have to say about America? What is his big belief in what America is doing and what's happening? Take two minutes because it's very short. And tell me on the right hand side, just react. What is his uh, response to what's happening in America in his views? Two minutes, go. I know, he's so great. <laughs> Two minutes, you're reading the text. As long as you read it and understood it. What do you think? What, what does he have to say? What, so what is your reaction to his, his belief in America at this time? 25 seconds. What is, what is, his, big, what is his big belief in America? Take a minute to talk to your partner. What is Hoover saying about America and why? What is his belief in American progress? Take a minute to chat about what he has to say as he's, as he's nominated for president. Santos, sir, what 
is Hoover so excited about as he takes the presidency? The status of America's economy? Yeah! America's economy, according to him, is, is going to do what? Not <clears throat> So, um, what's that, what's that thing called when people are poor? Poverty? Poverty, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's called America. Uh, so, but he's right. According to Hoover, we are about to solve poverty. We in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. We did it! Congratulations, America! Check us out! Because of the, the policies of the last eight years. Who was in charge of the last eight years? Republicans. Republicans. Who specifically? Wilson. Who was before him? And Warren G. Harding. So what, what kinds of policies is he referring to? What kinds of Pro policies? Pro-business, Pro be more specific. Tariffs, what else? Other T word tax government. Cuts. The tax cuts. We've, we've done more as a country in the last eight years through our policies to make America this close to getting rid of poverty. We, we advocate the purpose of our government policies is to, to make sure that every person can become successful. We did it. We're so close. Little does he know, he is so close to poverty growing by about 7,000%. He was, he's was almost there. He is so close to something, it's just the worst economic crisis in the world. My boy Hoover. Um, my f fun fact, you guys know I have my, uh, my presidential campaign mug. Well, I'm, uh, the, the presidential campaign's uh, posters and slogans, I like them a lot. My favorite of all the whole thing is a howl, and it says, who, who, Hoover. Right, it's my favorite president of the campaign thing on here. That's it, yeah. He ran on it, he's like, the economy's killing it, and here's this owl. <laughs> right? Vote for me. Uh, yeah. So, the stock market in the 1920s is worth diving into a little bit. As you guys know, we talked about yesterday, that a stock is a percentage, a little sliver that you own of a company. And the stock's value is based on confidence. It's based on perception. It's based on data for how successful and profitable this company is going to be. So say you guys all own stock in Apple. You with me? We all, we're all, so what would we want to see for Apple stock to go up? What, if we're all Apple stockholders, what do we want to see? Sell more. What? Sell more. Profits. What else? Projections. We're going to have a good year. Our sales are up. What might cause Apple stock to go down? Yeah, competition, public interest, uh, maybe a lawsuit uh, because they've been misusing their patents. Who knows? But the idea of a stock is it's based on not the profits of one company necessarily, but the general perception of the economy as a whole. The overall value of stocks increased 120% in the last four and a half years of the 1920s, so stocks are doing really, really well. But how are people buying stocks? Credit. On, margin. Credit. on margin. On margin, by paying for a percentage of the stocks. Let me, let's back this up for a second. Go back to our supply and demand situation. When demand is high, when demand is high, what happens to prices? Take a second. Make sure that we're all on the same page because you guys answer. If, if people want more of something, would the price go up or down? Uh, up. up, right? So check this out. Noe wants to buy a stock. Chris wants to buy a stock. With me? Now, if I tell you you got to pay 500 bucks up front, are you down? Do you want a stock that bad? Now, what do I tell you? You can, you can pay 50 bucks now and just keep paying as you go to pay for the rest of the value. Now you're a little more down? Why? You pay less up front. So what do we just artificially stimulate? What do we artificially stimulate? Make, make higher. Maybe, not yet. What do we, are in, the, in this whole equation of things, if I tell you like, yeah, no, instead of 500 bucks, you can have it for 50 bucks now, and then 100 bucks every month the next five months. We will, what do we first artificially stimulate? 
Prices? Demand. Demand. Because now they want something that they might not have wanted if they had to pay the full price. And then, because demand is artificially stimulated, then to do the prices, then get stimulated. Because you're just missing that in between step. So maybe maybe he didn't really have a lot of demand for it at 500 bucks, but at 50%, 50, 50 bucks now, and then 100 bucks a month for the next five months, now he's into it. We artificially stimulate demand, which then means we artificially stimulate prices. That's deep. So the idea being that Americans are borrowing money to buy stocks. We borrow money, we spend more money, and then our economy looks really good because everybody's buying stuff. Everything's so good. Demand is up, prices is up, everything's good. And then because the economy is good, we want to invest more in the economy because everybody's making so much more money in the stock market. So then in order to buy more, we're going to borrow more money and then we're going to have this cycle and cycle and cycle and cycle and cycle and then boom, we're going to fall off the tracks. Anybody ever rode a skateboard down a hill? Yeah. Luis has. That's I actually have a spot. Congratulations. <laughs> Somebody give this one a spot. Um, and you're going down the, you're going down a big hill, right? And it, it starts kind of fun. No, this is fun. And then what happens when you start going too fast? How to stop? Then you're, you can't stop, and you're holding on for dear life, like oh my god, oh my god. And then the hill gets steeper, and you're like, oh my life's about to end. This is done. <laughs> but that's the way it's going to work. In 1929, Hoover takes office. Everybody's killing. It's called a bull market. The stock market hit. The stock market hits a brand new high. 300 billion shares or percentage of company are being bought, not with cash, but on margin. Bought on margin. Bought with a small percentage. So now let's pretend, let me explain to you how this buying on margin works. I'll be the stock broker, the in-between. Pick a company. Let's pick General Electric. Anybody go home and look at your appliances? No. As LG. LG. Uh, they own a lot of things. General Electric, right? So here, I'm the middleman. Here's which. So I'm going to sell, who wants to be this, my stock buyer? No, you can't afford it. <laughs> All right, cool. So I got bread. Uh, the, the stock for, for uh, General Electric, General Electric, the stock is worth, let's say it's worth 100 bucks a share, per share. Now Brenda, she's a little broke. Not a lot broke, but a little broke. Uh, Brenda's just an everyday person. She works, what kind of job do you do, Brenda? You're a woman in the 1920s. You so close. <laughs> she's a black man on the job, bro. Uh, she's not a bar dancer. No, no. She'd, be, she'd have more money if she was. Um, Bren, Brenda sews. She works in textiles. Brenda sews clothes. You guys with me? Yeah. So does Brenda have a lot of disposable income, extra money? No. So should she be buying stocks with her extra money? No. No. But guess what? Does Brenda have 100 bucks laying around? No. What does Brenda have laying around? Ten. She got ten bucks. One she got ten bucks. So I will sell her this share on margin. She'll pay me ten bucks now. You with me? And then how much more money does she owe me? She owes me ninety bucks. But then I don't make any money. How am I going to make money? I'm going to charge her a little bit of interest. So she's going to do ten months. at ten dollars a month you with me so she paid me the ten up front and then she's gonna pay for the next ten months she's gonna pay me ten dollars every month so how much is she gonna pay me eventually yeah so she's gonna pay me 110 bucks how much money am I gonna make I'll make ten bucks and she has her stock now you with me but it's worth a hundred dollars a share so she has to pay me that ten bucks a month regardless now what happens if if in that 10 months, 10 months later, the stock is worth 160 bucks. Did she do well? Yeah. yeah. Did I do well? Yeah, I made my 10 bucks. We're good to go. What happens if after that 10 months, the stock's worth $70? How much did she pay? How much did she pay total? 110 bucks. And now how much value does she have in her hands? $70. So now she's 40 bucks. Do I still have my 10 bucks? Yeah. So the problem becomes all these stocks are being bought on margin, which is fine if what? 
If the market keeps going up, it's fine. If the market does not, now what happens if three months in, Brenda, because everything collapses, Brenda has lost her job, and now she can't pay me, and now I'm out all this extra money. A whole mess. So that's the buying on margin thing, and that's why it becomes a problem, is it only works if the market keeps going up. So 300 billion shares just in August of 1929, just in that month, 300 billion different percentages of companies are being bought and not being paid for, bought on margin. It's a get-rich-quick gamble. The money is earned off of dividends. So as the, as the price of the stock goes up, you can get paid a percentage of that, and then I can, we can pay everything back, and it's good to go. And the whole point of these margin buyers, and they don't have cash, they want to buy low, stock goes up, and then sell high, and then move on. This process, though, only works if the markets, the stock markets, continue to increase. So everything looks good. Everything is calm on the surface. Everything is exciting on the surface. The 1920s prosperity seems endless. Like Hoover just said, we're so close to ending poverty forever. We're this close. The economy is strong. The government is very supportive of business. The consumers are happy. They're buying everything. But standard living is also strong. More families have electricity. More families have appliances. More families have washing machines, stoves, cars. There's more variety of products. These chain stores like Sears are offering low prices, offering installment plans, more credit. And advertising is being used to make sure that everybody thinks there's always something new to buy. Buy, 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 buy. But Unforeseen to us, there is danger ahead. A couple of key industries are starting to fall apart, which should be red flags. Uh, right now, for example, there's some big red flags we came out in 2019. They came out with a report yesterday that says 7 million Americans have missed their last three car payments. That's a red flag. Everything looks good on the surface, but 7 million Americans have not paid their last three consecutive months of their car payment. Red flag. These red flag here. <laughs> I'm one of them. Um, these, these key industries are falling, and we're going to ignore the red flags. Railroads are falling. Textiles are falling. I, I told you this yesterday. Coal is falling. Right? All because of competition, all because of, of new things. Agriculture, however, is already fallen. Because of overproduction, because of overextension, these farmers have been taking too many loans to buy their new equipment. Uh, where do we start seeing these agricultural problems? Who first surfaced these problems? What group? The populace. The populace first identified these problems and we're too far in debt because we need to keep keeping up farm-wise and overproducing. Uh, not to mention just that, there's a world market, which there's competition for farm goods, so that drives prices down. Uh, and Congress tries to help, as you guys read in the previous chapter, Congress tries to help the farmers, but Coolidge vetoes the farm help bill. He's a Republican. We don't need to help people, we need to help business. So these three key industries, railroads, textiles, coals, and farm, are all having some struggles that maybe we should pay attention to. What do you guys think? Are we gonna pay attention to that? No, no because that would go against this Republican ideology of laissez-faire, support business, leave everything else alone. Unfortunately for Hoover, despite his promises that we are so close to ending poverty, the economy tumbles. Now the economy has been slowly slipping a little bit for a couple of years, we've been ignoring it. Um, and there's some key indicators we should talk about, some key indicators that are economic red flags. First is new construction declines. We stop building new things. That's a big red flag, that's a red flag in 2019 economy as well. When we're not building new things, it's not just that you're, you're hurting the construction business, you're hurting the apply. If you buy a new house, who benefits? Construction, appliances, construction, appliances uh, all, what else? Yeah, the buyer, uh, furniture, the, uh, infrastructure, maybe you need a new road, utilities. So every, it's not just about construction, there's a bunch of other related industries. New construction is, is declining. Same if you're building a new factory, who benefits? The jobs, right? the equipment, 
All this stuff helps the economy. And bigger than just that, consumer purchases are dropping. People are buying less stuff. Why? What's that? It's not just they couldn't pay back their old stuff. That's a part of it. Why else? You don't need a second stove. Wages? Wages are, are pretty flat as well. But to put it quite simply, people have everything they need. So now it's time to start paying it back. People have their stove. People have their refrigerator. People have their vacuum cleaner. People have their car. People. Ha so what are, what's America going to keep doing? Are we going to stop producing? No, God, no, I'll do that. So this leaves a huge, surpluses are bad. We're going to read about some surpluses in a second. We have a bunch of stuff, but nobody wants to buy it anymore because they already have all things they need. And when you have a surplus, that means that profit goes down. When profit goes down, prices go down. And this surplus idea means you have more than you can sell. And that's a big red flag for, say, General Electric stock value. Now, if General Electric isn't selling as much, what happens to their stock prices? What do you guys think? Yeah. Right? So say in one quarter, they have to project their earnings. All of a sudden, they're making less money. People panic. Right? The brands of the world are like, what the hell? I bought this stock. I need this stock to do really well. What do you mean their sales are down? And panic leads to more panic, and more panic leads to a Great Depression. So the Depression's been coming because of overproduction of consumer goods, overproduction of agriculture, a decrease in foreign trade, a decrease in foreign trade um, as, as there's more competition from Europe after the war, and a big problem, as I just heard a report on the news this morning, 2019 America is the first time since 1929 that the gap between the rich and the poor have been this big. Oof. Well, it's been nice knowing you. We just had the 20s. We're going to be the farmers. We are the farmers. We banned the Great Depression. You are the farmers. Yeah. No, no. They said it's like, so right now, according to that, that, according to that idea, like we are just went through the 20s. The 20s are done. Or it's already 1929. So this unequal distribution of wealth, our consumers are in too much debt. So we're, we're in too much debt, the everyday people, because of credit. The stock market has, uh, is inflated. It's worth, it says it's worth more than it's actually worth. Uh, all means that everyday consumers have less purchasing power. We have less ability to buy stuff because now the everyday people have too much credit card or, or consumer debt. They're not making enough money because their wages are flat. Uh, the stock market is overinflated. All combined means we have less purchasing power. Yes, sir, Kevin. So if when we do have a recession, mm -hmm. and if it does happen soon, uh, would our student loan be lower? Uh, no, your interest rates might be. Yeah. Um, but in general, student loans are, are a pretty reasonable interest rate anyway. That's a good Thursday after school question I'd be happy to talk about today. It's a great question. It's Thursday. So consumers already own goods, and they're not buying stuff. And that's going to lead to this whole, this whole, there's a whole series of these things. So as, as this happens, Wall Street, where our stock market is, starts to notice. And when Wall Street starts to notice that people are buying less, people have too much debt, people have no money, what's going to happen to our stock prices? Talk to me, guys. So, so... As, as the stocks are supposed to forecast how profitable business is going to be. So as all these indicators start telling us that the economy is, is, is kind of going to eh, what happens is the stock, stock prices. They're going to dip a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you guys all own stocks. Congratulations. We're going to show this earlier. What are you going to do when the stock dips a little bit in value? Buy more. Use logic for a second as an everyday person in 1929. Wait, you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen. So, well, you don't know what's going to happen. If, if we get to the end of the 20s and the stock market goes like from basically this, and we start to see this, what do you do? You, you sell it. How many of you guys think if things started to dip and you owe, you owe money on the stock still and you need this money, it starts to dip. How many of you sell your stocks? What do you guys think? Ruby, why would you sell it? 
Talk to your partner for 30 seconds, make an argument. Would you buy or sell stock for 30 seconds? <laughs> Almost like I'm good at my job. Ten seconds. Eight seconds. Seven seconds. Oh my god. Six seconds. Five seconds. Four seconds. Three seconds. Two seconds. One second. And you are done. But you're everyday people that need this money. Chavez, speak to me. So the economy is like there's always fluctuating, so it's like that and like that. So because it's going down, eventually it's gonna come back up. So oh, is it? Stops, That's what I'm saying. Okay, keep going. Well, I mean, growth history always happens, so I would assume it will go back up. So if I sell my stock now, I'll lose money and be like, oh shit. No, you bought it. You bought it right here. So you made money. And then, and then you're worried that as it starts to go down, it might go down. You don't know what's going to happen next. Stop. Go ahead. Well, yeah, in that case, would, we would just sell it just to be on the safe side. And if anything bad happens, we're safe. If anything bad doesn't happen, we could just buy them when they're low again. Okay. Oh, that's reasonable. Brett, what do you think? All I'm saying is that if I don't know there's a Great Depression going to happen, and I know that our economy has been on the rise, Yes. and I'm like, one dip doesn't really phase me. It doesn't phase you, okay? Now, what if you're an everyday person who has everything they own in the stock market? Which is what happens in the 1920s. Everything these people own is bought at this value. Take risk. Take risk? All right, cool. Now, now, what happens? Hear me out. Hear me out. Because the Santoses of the world and the Rubies of the world and the Cats of the world, they sold. So now, now we're here because there's more supply of stock, therefore less demand. Now what? Now what do you do? I mean, now. You sell. Oh now, oh now you sell. But guess what? When you sell, she sells, she sells, he sells, and he sells. <laughs> and now we're in. Oh, no. And that because now, but now, oh now we sell. So then that second wave happens. And now we're below what you bought it at. And now, and now, and now it's like, oh crap! Like, do we get out now before it goes even lower? Or do you hope that that was it and now it's going to go up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and now in your case, you're screwed if you do, you're screwed if you don't. Because just like the farmers in overproduction. They want to sell. Chris, you did not just interrupt him. I apologize. Just like the farmers in overproduction, just like the farmers in overproduction, it's not just up to you. It's up to the market as a whole. Because we can have all the Chavez's in the world who are like, I know it's going to come back eventually, but if the rest of the world is panicking, just like the farmers, I'm going to produce less because overproduction puts my prices down, but everybody else is overproducing. And now you should have been Ruby and sold it right here. Everybody wants to be Ruby and sell it right here. So you say we were selling to, you were selling to uh, Europe, Europe, right? No, this is just stock. Ah, oh, never mind. So, what happens, regard, what, Luis? All right, so, you know how you said, as soon as it's conservative, like, they should sell it, right? It's not what I said. No, but, like, you know, I said, what, what are you going to no, do? Yeah, that's that's what they're arguing? You know yes. Said, Shh. Like, didn't someone else just buy that, but, like, on margin? Not if everybody else is panicking and everything starts to tumble. So, basically, What happens, <laughs> what, no, what happens is the overinflation of the stock market in the first place means these stocks are being sold for more than they're worth. What happens is it starts to dip, though, is the first wave panics and they get mo their money. But then that means that everybody's selling stocks. So now what's happened with our, with our supply? Our, our supply. Our supply is increasing what happens to prices. So prices go down because there's more of it. So now the next wave panics. And then the next wave panics. And then we got Chavez in 1932 sitting on his stock. <laughs> Right here, like don't worry, it's gonna go back up again. I only lost 17 million bucks. <laughs> so a stock sell-off begins because people panic. So they start selling because they want to get out as soon as possible. To your point, Luis, investors are like, okay, cool, things are going down. Like I'll buy up what I can at a lower rate, and that sustains it for a second until the second tumble hits. 
So as things start to dip and then come up and then dip and then come up, people are trying to do the, the smart investor thing. You guys are going to all outsmart the Great Depression. You're not going to. Until October 21st, 1929, in which, so it kind of goes like this, like down, up, down, up. And we're like, okay, cool. I buy here, that's the bottom of it. Down, up. And then October 21st comes and it goes like this. <laughs> So all these people thought they were like getting it at the bottom, but it wasn't anywhere near the bottom. Because to Luis's point, they kept trying to like rebuy in at that like lesser rate as it dips a little bit, but there's too much panic and inflation in the market and eventually it just keeps tumbling. So you can you think you're buying it at the bottom, but when Black Tuesday hits, that's what it's called, everything drops. And even those then who are buying on margin, you have to sell because you still owe the money for that stock, whatever it's worth. So all those, buy, all those buyers on margin, the 300 billion shares bought in October of this month, all those people have to sell as soon as possible because they're going to owe that money whether they, that stock is worth what they bought it for or not. October 29, we sell 16 million shares in one day of stock, which is a huge percentage of the market. Here's the, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Wall Street in panic as stocks crash. Below that, attempt made to kill Italy's crown prince. All right, cool. <laughs> That guy almost died, but holy oh, shit, our stocks. So this market sell-off, and everyone's selling and selling and selling. This market sell-off is known as Black Tuesday. So this, this stock market crash is caused by panic and overinflation in the stock market. It is very self-fulfilling. Once we start to panic, what happens to the prices? Once we start to panic, what do the prices go? Up or down? <laughs> down. And then, and then as the prices go down, what happens to the rest of the prices? So it's a very self-fulfilling fear. And as, as we get more scared, the prices go down, and it's a cyclical, terrible thing. The bottom falls out, and in one day, the prosperity of the 1920s ends. All these people are lying trying to get their money out of the bank. The bank has no more money. Because the banks were also investing in the stock market with your money, and now the bank has no money to cover the money you gave the bank, and now not only is your stock worthless, but your checking and your savings account also have no money because the bank has failed. Because now it's not just the stocks that Josue bought. Josue put money in my bank, I took Josue's money and I put it in the stock market. And now Josue's money is gone as well. So here's what I'm talking about. The stock market, you guys are all trying to be smart, right? A little dip and up, a little dip and up, and then, oh, we're coming back. We were right to buy when we did. And then, boom. And now we're at values that we haven't seen since 1919, and all that value of the stock market is gone, gone. So what are the crashes? What are the causes of the, the Great Depression? Uh, there's long-term causes, short-term causes. There's political policies or causes. Right? Cutting taxes and, and raising tariffs led to inflation. Cutting taxes and raising tariffs led to inflation. Remember our boy Calvin Coolidge, the business of the American people is business? Yeah, when we have no business, the American people are broke. There are financial causes, uh, buying on margin, uh, a very tight money policy. Uh, the Dawes plan of trying to force Germany to pay back all their war debts and that Germany can stop buying our form because they have no money either. So there's a bunch of, of, of financial policies that are largely driven by credit and margin and the Dawes plan from your reading as they try to insist that Germany pays back their, their loans. Overproduction economically, agricultural overproduction, industrial overproduction. There's too much goods in the market. And last but not least, there are socioeconomic causes as well. I know some of you guys can't see this, but the top 1% of America owns over a third of the country's wealth. The top 1% owns 35% of the country's money. And the bottom 20% of, of our economy, the bottom fifth, owns only 4% of the nation's wealth. So we have a huge income disparity, wealth disparity, in addition to these financial reasons, political reasons, and um, economic situations. So, it's not just the stock market crash. The stock market crash really is just the, the exp exclamation point um, to what's happening in the 1920s that lead us to this place. All right. Uh, some historians disagree on the actual cause-cause. 
I would argue the cause is, is more compound. Short-term causes, long-term causes. But our monetary policy of really low interest rates allow people to borrow too much money. All right, when money's cheap to borrow, people borrow more money. That's what interest rates are. Super high tariffs are bad, because if we have high tariffs, uh, what do other countries uh, do then to us? Less trade. Yeah, less trade. Right? If we're buying less stuff from England, England will buy less stuff from us. The stock market crashes, overproduction, and this unequal distribution of wealth is a good way to, to really categorize our causes. And now, we are no longer close to eradicating poverty. Instead, we have uh, overnight quadrupled our poverty and then sextupled our poverty. And I don't even know what the, the word is for 10 times the, our problem. Probably. Yeah. So now what used to be that, that upward cycle of, of borrow money, economy's good, borrow more money, prosperity, now we'll have a different cycle, a bad cycle, an unemployment cycle. You saw the pretty one before. This is the, the opposite. Now people have less money to spend. You were all buying stock. Everybody had money, everything was good. And now, people have less money to spend. People have less money to spend, who hurts? Yeah. The business class hurts because you're not buying their goods. So the business loses profit. And if the business sucks, then what happens? Can they hire people? No. So businesses can't afford to pay workers, they lay off their workers, and now people have less money to spend, and then less money to spend, and then less money to spend. So it's the same cycle as before, except instead of borrowing more money because the economy's good and everything's going up, now it's the downward cycle. But if I own a business and I employ these four people, and I made pretty bad decisions in my hiring <laughs> practice, right? Uh, and then you four lose your job, and you can't come to my business anymore, do I have any money to spend? No. No, so who do I lay off? No, you're, you're my consumer. So now first I'll lay off Rubia. <laughs> But now guess what? That's a fifth person now that has no job and can't spend money. So it ends up being this endless cycle of poverty. So I have some good pictures for you guys, as America does not know how to react to this. Some soup kitchens, some bread lines. Look at that. Look at that freaking bread line. To get bread. Let's get this bread. <laughs> and they get a line. We'll get this bread in like three and a half to four hours. <laughs> We're gonna get this bread eventually. Uh, or, or soup. Just be on your phone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you mean you can't play? <laughs> soup kitchen. Soup kitchen. Uh, St. Peter's Mission. What do we imply this is? A church. A church. All right, some sort of a, ch a charity or church situation. One of my favorite pictures, because it really shows the juxtaposition between the 20s and the 30s. I'll give you a second on this. Highest <laughs> standard of living. Oh, I love this. <laughs> go back. I have to do that again. Pretty messed up. Oh. What? <laughs> the dog's living a better life. <laughs> the dog. There's always a dog. But look at this. So we see the 1930s literally in the shadow of the 1920s. Advertisement, consumerism, happiness, prosperity, breadline. Imagine having to wait in this breadline. Oh. See you down there smiling at me in your car. There's no way like the American way, world's highest standard of living. Not anymore. It's not even a cartoon. Yeah, I agree. This is a good one because it just shows the, the black and white uh, nature. Literally. Literally, yeah. Literally, yeah. That's funny. Um, we see people thinking they can move. Effects being uh, obviously poverty and whatnot, but a ton of internal migration. As people think they can get jobs elsewhere, they pack up their entire life and they go. Men are trying to provide for their families. Uh, hopping on trains, going town to town to town, hoping that there's jobs in the next town, jobs in the next town, there's jobs nowhere. So we start seeing signs like this at train stations. Jobless men keep going. We can't even take care of our own. So these chambers of commerce, these pro-business 
groups that were pushing the tax cuts of the 20s. You saw them in the cartoon of the, the well, the brakes hold. One of the groups shouting was Chamber of Commerce, go, cut, cut, cut. Now they're realizing that we're in a place where we can't even take care of our own. Now, the 1% of society is going to be kind of okay because not all, not all their money is going to be wrapped up in the stock market. They'll have other funds and resources. Now, the consequences of the crash are different than the effects. Yes? What if you're a farmer and you're making your own food? Uh, good. Well, where are you going to sell stuff to? Uh, how are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to pay for your farm? Because somebody has to buy your food. That's the whole point. So consequences, the biggest consequence isn't the stock market, it's bank failures. Because when a bank has no money to give out to the people that, bar that put money in the bank, the bank fails. That's a big, big problem. The problem becomes banks are stupid. How do, ba how do bank <laughs> banks? <laughs> banks? <laughs> banks are stupid. So, um, Luis is mad now. He ruined his day. Um, if you put your money in the bank today, can you go back and get that money tomorrow? Yes. Yes. Is, is it the same money? No. No. So, so I say I go put a hundred bucks in the bank. You with me? They don't put it in a little envelope that says Winchell, and they leave it in a box. So when I come back to the hundred bucks, they go, "Oh, sir, here's the hundred dollars you gave us." They don't do that. The bank takes your money and it invests your money, and then they keep the profit from the investment and they give you your money back. That's how banks make money. How dare they? What if the investment doesn't work? We'll talk about that on Monday. But in this time period, banks have no restrictions. So, so Noe puts his money in the bank. Chris puts his money in the bank. Luis puts both dollars in the bank. <laughs> uh, and, and they put all their money in the bank, and the bank turns right around and buys stocks with it. And then what happens when the stock crashes? The bank is like, oh, shit. And then here comes Luis to get his money first, and they have enough money to cover Luis's deposit because it's two bucks. Uh, and then here comes Noe, and, and they're like, yeah, they have, they have the 250 to cover Noe's money, but they don't have any more money left when Chris comes, and now Chris is out of luck. There's no regulation that says the bank has to hold his money, so guess what? Sorry, bro. I really hate to tell this to you, but your money is gone. And he's like, what do you mean when he's gone? I gave him my money. He's like, yeah, you see what happened? Stop. It's gone. Wait, yes. So would that person ever get their money? Back? No, because the bank fails. The bank the bank's bankrupt, and you're you're out of luck. Now, you want to read this this weekend, or you'll read it on Monday morning in advisory. Um, now there's what's called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, where now banks can't uh, take your money and put it in high risk investments like the stock market. They put it in like slow, gradually raising money things like like in, uh, bonds and funds. Um, and even if, if even if a bank fails now, which happens very rarely, the federal government insures your money so you get your money back. But in this time period, nope. So we see people like banging on the windows of banks, like, not actual banks, calm down. Uh, like, I need my, and the banks are just, the banks are closing. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> so in one year, 1,300 banks fail, which means their money's gone, all their investors lose their money. In the next three years, 5,000 more banks fail. Nine million people have their savings account wiped out, gone. So now it's not just the stock market that you lost your money in, that little money you had in the bank and savings has gone too. 85,000 different businesses close, businesses and factories go bankrupt and are wiped out, gone. Unemployment hits 25%, which is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, and people start losing their farms as well, foreclosures. 400,000 farmers lose their farms because they can't pay their bills either because there's nobody to buy their farm goods. And because of this, the foreign markets collapse as well. So it starts with the US and then England and then France and the rest of Europe and the Asian markets. As our economy falls apart, everything else falls in on top. Because we've been spending so much time investing in other countries post World War I, uh, that now the entire thing collapses in on itself. Good work. Why, my question is why is it called the Great Depression? That's really deep. 
It's really, it's really messed up. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty great. It's amazing. Um, so it's not just the poor. The depression hits all classes. Families lose their farms. Families lose their homes. And they start living in what we would consider today like skid row. Right? Where people just like put up camp and they just stay. And what do they call them? They call them Hoovervilles. That's why they call them Hoovervilles. It's pretty amazing. If you're the president, like this is worse than Martin Van Ruin. Right? You're calling your little, your little homeless neighborhood a Hooverville. Uh, people are covering themselves with newspapers and calling them Hoover blankets. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, and people, when there's a lot of beggars. People are walking around with their pockets out like so, saying, I'm broke too, and they're calling them Hoover flags. I know, it sucks to be Hoover. It sucks to be Hoover. Uh, and... It's, it hits, of course, minority classes. Uh, tell them, so I can sit double. Uh, we see unprecedented, never before seen poverty. Our country's poorer than it's ever been. We see fathers abandoning their families because of an inability to support their families. Uh, and a huge increase in suicides. People find out they lose everything and they just go home and kill themselves. Because everything they'd worked for for all this time is gone. Uh, after school today, I'll show you guys a little clip from a really good documentary called The Century America's Time that goes over, like, the, the, the personal reaction to this. It's deep. Um, African Americans, of course, who migrated north in this great migration are the first ones laid off. <laughs> Mexican Americans uh, are, are facing competition in the southwest because uh, angry white people were like, why should they make a living if I can't? Uh, and the middle class is hit the hardest. Right, because they're that kind of ones that are, are left, like the upper class still okay, the lower class, we're gonna help them out because they're the lowest class. And the middle class loses their homes, loses their health care. Uh, uh, they, they, they can't get relief checks and charity, and it sucks. So I'm going to read this text from a black man's perspective. A uh, black worker, worker named Clifford Burke in Chicago. Uh, he's going to talk about how he sees the depression. I think it's a very interesting perspective. I think it is. Uh, I'm going to tell you, just to evaluate his perspective, how does he characterize the Great Depression for a black worker and why? All right? So it's a good text. I think you guys enjoy it. I'll give you five. To get it read and responded, it gives you a nice little insight into what's happening in the Great Depression for workers in Chicago. Kelly, yes. Hold on. Hold on. And if you finish early, there's a really good slide of the Depression by the numbers for you to look at. Lighting it. doesn't.
back this mess. Look at the numbers. Thank you. Okay. Guys, good news. Uh, Luis approves the use of this document. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually good. We're, we're good now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. I thought I was causing a turning in bed. I was out very. Uh, I, don't, I don't sweat doing nothing like some. Um, I was laying in bed, like, I really wonder if Luis is going to like this document. <laughs> <laughs> Respond for me. And if you're done, look at the numbers. If you're done, look at the numbers. If you're done, look at the numbers. A lot of, I'm not going to go over all this. There's a ton of value up here, though. Seems about right. A trillion? So as you're done, as, as you're done, look at the number. That's quite off some good ones for you. Margaret Sanger, 1920s. That was in our lecture on Monday. Yeah. All right, take a minute, touch your. Stop getting excited. <laughs> we'll talk about that in about eight to ten years. Um, take a minute. I give it to you. I give it to you. Sixteen years ago. All right. I know. It works. Take a minute, touch your partner. Uh, what is? This is black workers' perspective on the Great Depression and why. Talk it out for a minute. Go for it. Go. 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 What is this black workers' perspective? Uh, Hilda. Hilda. Josue Bill, because you guys had a good point. Or no way, so no way had a good point. Talk to us, go ahead. Uh, what, is, what, is this, what is this Great Depression to, uh, to black workers? Good. A lot of people that, uh, that they're already living in constant depression. Like, they've always been accustomed to like, doing what they can to their life. So who experiences the Great Depression according to this author? Yeah, people that had the prosperity of the 20s? 
That's the depression. But if you were just down here the whole time chilling, like you're like, man, why is everybody so grumpy? <laughs> it's a crowded ass soup line. Man, this is crazy. <laughs> so, but it's it's true that that if you compare like 1932 America to like 1912 America, it's not that much different. It's just that we did this in the process. So the fact is, like, it's not that it, the, the idea of a Great Depression is because it's compared to something better. And if you've never experienced something better, what's the difference? Turn your page. The numbers are, are to me, like, when I look at the, I use this slide every year. The numbers are mind-numbing. That we see in 1929, 3% of America is unemployed. 3% is nothing. I would argue that this is too low of unemployment. Because I think, my personal opinion, 6 to 7% of America is unemployable. Think about it. <laughs> like, six, six, think about some of your friends. 6 to 7% of America should not work a job, right, uh, anywhere. Uh, did I say that? What? You're one of the so, yeah, because you'd be working at the Wendy's Jive, like, have you heard of Earl Banks? Like, sir, <laughs> <laughs> sir, I just want food. Those are nuggets, nuggets. Like, yeah. okay. I, I asked for the six piece nuggets. I don't know who Earl Banks is. Can I please make my food now? So, we go from in four years, 3% to 25%. Wow. In some places, it's even higher. Like, Toledo, Ohio is a big industrial town, it's at 90%. Oh, our national income falls 60%, our salaries fall 40%, our industrial falls 50% by 1932. The numbers, in my opinion, are freaking staggering. The Dow Jones industrial average is complicated, they still have it today. It's basically a general consensus of the whole stock market as a whole. Right? So maybe one stock goes down, but other stocks go up. The Dow Jones is like the average of all the stocks. It goes from 381 to 41. It's staggering the numbers that, that really get us into the, the idea of what's happening in this Great Depression. It's absolutely unbelievable. Look at our unemployment. From almost nothing to that, boom, in the span of two and a half years. And then it gradually decreases. We'll talk about this on Monday. It goes back up and then gradually decreases. And what actually gets us out of the Great Depression? World War II. World War II. Right? You'll read about the New Deal and FDR. The New Deal does not end the Great Depression. It makes the Depression more tolerable. World War II ends the Great Depression. As we transition to a war economy, a full-scale industrial economy to support the war. Before we're even in the war. Much like World War I, we're going to be supplying the war before we're there. And that's what, what ends the Great Depression. So, let's talk about Hoover's response, my favorite. <laughs> um, Hoover believes in what's called the business cycle. Hoover believes what Chavez believes. That things go up, things peak, things go down, things bottom out, and then things go up again. Has that always been true in American history? Yeah. I think about 1893 was the worst example. And what got us out of it in 1893? J.P. Morgan. So over time, you could argue our depressions have gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. And even in our, our last big one of 1893, we needed some outside support to get out of the great out of that what was called the Great Depression at the time. We don't call it the Great Depression anymore because then this one hit. So Hoover's like the Mark, Hoover's very um, uh, Adam Smith esque, hands off. Right, the market will return itself to prosperity. Self-regulating, natural laws, supply and demand. Nobody can fix the economy. It's this crazy, wild thing nobody knows anything about. It'll come back. It'll come back. Eventually, don't worry. Don't worry. I know this bread line sucks. I know Toledo, Ohio has 90% unemployment. But this is just a regular recession. Give us a year or two, we'll be back on our feet. We'll be back on our feet. So his reaction to the, uh, the Great Depression is largely to uh, keep the government's hands off the problems because it doesn't matter what the government can do, the economy will eventually find its way back. It's pretty deep. So take this is a good cartoon. I like this cartoon. I don't, I'm not going to say it's top ten, but it's, it's a good cartoon. 
Take two with your partner and analyze what this perspective of this cartoon is. All right, take two minutes. Uh, dive into it. It's on the board as well. Uh, two minutes. Go for it. What is the what's the con the context is obvious. Great question. What's the point of view of the purpose of this cartoon though? Shout it out. Dive in. Go for it. to dive into, I understand. Um, who is this guy? Yeah, we got Hoover, and we have business and the public. And what is this building? Nope. The Capitol. Capitol building. So here we have this, this U.S. resources and business courage. Courage is going to solve our problems. If you just believe enough, no way, you can accomplish anything. Who's heard that before? If you just believe, yeah. it's nonsense. Mr. Bush. You gotta work. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm just <laughs> hurtling through the galaxy. So, uh, but it's true that this cartoonist is critical of Hoover for expecting that with the public and business putting a little bit of coal into the economy, we'll get our way out of it. Good. Because here we have, our country is today stronger and richer in resources and equipment and in skill than ever in history. The president's message. Well, how did you see it? Which is wrong. All right. Share us your All false right. identity. So I thought this was like, um, you know, a farmer. So what I believe was that this farmer was experiencing the depression before anyone else. And you see over there, uh, businesses and the public, uh, they're illicit, they're profiting. Oh, that's deep, but no. So, uh... This idea of all together now, let's turn on the heat, hoping that this is all together now, that we're all in this together. We can, with our resources, we can end unemployment and end uh, the drought problems. Is the, is the snowman really melting? No not, really. no, not really. Not really. So Hoover's approach is my favorite. This is great. You guys are going to love Hoover. <laughs> Hoover's approach is neither laissez-faire or government invention. He doesn't want to help business at this point or help people. He preaches what he calls volunteerism. Hey, you're broke? You know what you should do? You should go talk to the private charity or the church around you. They can help you out. Where do private charities and churches get their money? Bank. Bank, man. Where do people get their, where, where do churches and, and, and uh, charities get their money from? Oh, from the people, from donations. So, how's the church going to get money to pay? <laughs> That if we work together through voluntary action, that big business should help you out, that we're going to cooperate together, that, that, we're all, that we're all good people. If you rely on the good people around you, we can get ourselves out of this. But the good people around you are also what? Broke. 
So what Hoover does is he overestimates the altruism of business. Who knows what altruism is? The goodness, like the, the inherent positivity. He thinks that, that business is, is run by good Americans, and good Americans will look out for other good Americans. Hmm. And the Americans that have money are like, y'all hear something? Mm -mm. I don't hear a damn thing, right? Um, and, and he's very opposed to having the government help. Hoover's response is literally to do what? No, Nothing. No. Yeah, Hoover's response is literally, y'all hear something. I don't hear no broke people in the soup lines. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you tried the local church? So the name for Hoover's approach, <laughs> my favorite. I love Hoover. I love Hoover. Uh, the name for his approach is rugged individualism. That's a good cartoon. Rugged, don't turn your page yet, you're gonna bottom down. Rugged individual what does individualism imply? Yeah. We got this for you. So rugged means tough. Hey, the look at our business cycles. The economy back in two years, the economy's always back in two years. Tough it out, look out for yourself, uh, look out for the people around you, but you'll be just fine. He says that finding solutions outside of government, that finding answers without relying on government, that builds character. That builds toughness. Oh my. Like I know where the line for the bread is a long line, but you're going to be tougher after it, and your bread will probably be tough as well, nice and stale. <laughs> when the crash happens, Hoover doesn't identify, because he just, uh, who did Hoover give all the credit for for the economy being good? Republicans. Republicans. So when you do that as a president, then who gets the blame when the economy goes down? Republicans. Republicans. He took all the credit. And then when it goes down, he's like, no, 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 no. It's not Republican policies. It's a lack of confidence. Oh. You be, you all just, if you all just start putting your money back in banks, back in the stock market, it'll come back up. Let me ask you something. Are you guys willing to put your money back in a bank after that bank just lost all your money? No. no. You got eight bucks and it's under your mattress. He says if we have more confidence back here, Business courage, if we just believed, you gotta believe harder in a way. If we have more more belief, then we get ourselves out. And he says, This is just the care, this is just the business cycle. It goes boom, bust, boom, bust. It's just a little bust. We're gonna boom again in a little bit. We're good to go. What's up? You got your two fifties? Oh yeah, you're good to go. You're good to go. Uh, so this idea of volunteerism is Hoover just talking a big game. Hey guys. It'll be better. Hey, you're good. It's going to be okay. Prosperity's going to re uh, return. And everyone's like, hey, man, here's an idea. Why don't you try to use the government to solve these problems? And he's like, <laughs> no. Why would I do that? I'm a Republican. Because that Republican ideology is non-intervention, non-support. Who rejects government action. As the, as the depression gets worse, he does a little bit, too little, too late. Reconstruction Finance Corps is one example, loaning some business, uh, but for the most part, he doesn't do much. Uh, uh, last year for the AP test day, uh, she wore a, a phenomenal uh, nerdy sweatshirt, uh, which said, keep calm and let Hoover handle it. <laughs> and it took me like six minutes to realize what she was wearing and why that was hilarious, because Hoover handled nothing. Uh, but she passed the test anyway. So turn your page. Uh, I found this uh, outstanding text just the other day. It does a good job of explaining the, the real problem, and then we'll close up strong. So this is a newspaper editor named Oscar Ameringer. And he's talking to Congress about what he's seen in the Great Depression uh, here during Hoover's term. Uh, so I have three questions for you. What conditions does he identify? How does this represent a real paradox of the Great Depression? And what consequences does he warn of if the problems of the Depression are not resolved? I think it's a great text. You guys will enjoy it. Uh, I'm going to give you seven. Seven whole minutes to read it and return to all three questions. Go.
enlightening piece of text that you should enjoy. Right along. make pork. To be a popper. Like Prince in the popper. Remember that? It's old like childhood book. Good chat. Childhood books don't get old. Awesome. About four or so minutes left. Good text. Embrace it. The last two questions are my favorite. I guess y'all both short and small. Have three minutes left for me, please. There's a ton of good stuff in that text. It helps get you like why the Great Depression ends up being as bad as it does. Pour that out, you have a nice, full, rich conversation. No, no, of, of the depression itself. Like, how is the Great Depression represented the paradox? That, like, both sides of our society have plenty, but they can't sell it to the other because the other side's not money. You know how I say school, though, right? It's not like something that Dr. Seuss took and used. No, it's a different boost.
I need all three questions answered in the next one minute. I'll give you plenty of time. When I say paradox, like how is the Great Depression a a like the, the situation that is solvable but unsolvable because of the, the situation he identifies largely in that middle chunk. Yeah, the fact that we have we produce plenty but we can't afford to buy it, so we just end ourselves in a, in a vicious cycle of, of paradox. <laughs> I'm so glad it was you just. <laughs> What? Jose <laughs> was like, why did he just eat all the sheep? No, That's what I said. I mean, I would. Like, 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 he had a. He had, no, the problem was he already had a free lunch sheet. A lunch sheet, a post lunch. All right. Okay. Uh, ante oh. Antebellum dinner. That's a happy hour sheep. Um, take a minute. Talk to your partner. How does this demonstrate like the depth of the Great Depression in a way that offers solutions, but solutions that America with its current system can't resolve? Take a minute, talk about it. Go for it. How about it? How about it? How about it? Go. Seven seconds. Hey, don't help. All right. So, looking at this from a structural standpoint, looking at this from a structural standpoint, uh, what's the problem in America, according to this dude? Cat, uh, talk to us. Structurally speaking, what's America's problem according to this guy? And he's and this is a much longer thing. He talked about all the states he goes to. I just cut out the fact that it's very repetitive. Go for it. What's the problem? Oh, uh, what I uh huh. Sure, but what's the problem? Talk to me. P.S. People living in poverty. Sure, Slaney. What's the problem? Uh, in terms of structure, I feel like it's something like the business or whatever, like say farms, business aren't really working together, they're more working like individually. Okay. And that's why they're like, if one thing fails, the rest of the things start failing too. Sure. Agreed. Agreed. Go ahead. Nothing's being done by the government to help solve these problems. Yeah, we, we have enough, but the government's not doing anything to solve these problems. That's a huge part of it. Talk to me. Uh, but since like they're always looking to like profit. That's a huge problem. That's capitalism. Because they're just like throwing everything away. They're throwing everything else away, that's fair. Uh, is there enough food in America to solve hunger? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Is there enough industrial goods so that everybody can have what they need? Yeah. But the problem is the farmers can't sell their food, so they stay poor, and then their food rots. 